Yeah. Hi, you know, I'm, uh, I'm Bill Scherer. How many people were here for the first time? Oh, wow, okay, great, super. Glad to have you back, glad to see some new people. Glad to see uh, Ernie. Known Ernie for a lot of years, although I only see him like once every 20 years, right? <laughs> so, the, uh, the title of the series is Mindfulness-Based Anxiety and Stress Management for Healthcare Professionals. Why healthcare professionals? Because all the evidence seems to indicate that uh, healthcare professionals have more stress, stress than uh, most occupations, and for, for all kinds of reasons that we'll get into in another talk. Um, also, close to 70% of the patients who come here have stress as a major factor in why they're coming. Doesn't mean that the stress causes the problem, but stress definitely is part of the problem and exacerbates the problem. In some cases, it actually does cause the problem. So we're talking about, that's the overall theme of all these talks is mindfulness-based anxiety and stress management for healthcare professionals. If you can think of a shorter name, let me know. I'll, I'll plug it in. Today, we're going to talk about worry. Worry. Um, how many people saw the, the flyer I put out on worry? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I kind of summed it up here. I said worry means feeling uneasy or concerned about something or being troubled about a problem. It's often part of an unhealthy cycle of anxiety. We all worry. Uh, but a lot of people experience toxic worry. And so we're going to talk, we're talking about toxic worry, not the kind of ordinary worry that we all have every day, but a, the kind of worry that can be disabling and can really destroy your quality of life. How many people have heard of um, a guy named Larry Walters? Anybody hear of Larry Walters? Okay, he was in the news a few years ago, but you probably don't know the name. He was a guy that was uh, sitting in his lawn chair in his yard in Los Angeles. And he was kind of bored, and he was sitting there drinking beer and daydreaming. And he started daydreaming about what it would be like to fly. Okay? So then Larry, being a, a very creative, innovative guy, he went down to his local Army-Navy store, and he bought a whole bunch of weather balloons. And he attached all these weather balloons to his lawn chair. And he tethered the lawn chair to his Jeep so that it wouldn't all float away, right? Then he got into his lawn chair, and he strapped himself up, he made himself a sandwich, and he got some more beer, got into his lawn chair. Oh, he also had a pellet gun. His plan was he was going to release the weather balloons, and he and his lawn chair would hover over his neighborhood about 100 feet off the ground, and after a little while, he'd shoot a balloon out, and he'd settle back to Earth. Nice plan, right? Okay. Except when he let go of the tether, he r rocketed into the air, not 500 feet, not 1,000 feet, but 14,000 feet into the air. So here's Larry drifting along in his, law, in his recliner, in his lounge chair, with his sandwich and his beer and his pellet gun. And, and nobody really knew what was happening to poor Larry until a, a, a passenger plane coming in at LAX radioed in and said, hey, look, you're not going to believe this, but we just passed a guy in a lawn chair with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got a helicopter up and they tethered him off, you know, and they pulled him down, you know, and, and uh, then they arrested him for violating L.A. airspace. But I've often thought about what, what Larry must have gone through. Can you, he was surprised that it was so successful, you know, not 100 feet, but 14,000 feet. And he's up there, can you imagine? He's up there thinking, okay, do I dare pop a balloon? Because he might go down as fast as he went up, right? So he's up there contemplating this whole thing. And I think, I think toxic worry is a lot like that. I think toxic worry is the kind of thing where you have this gnawing at you, and sometimes people wake up at 2 a.m. and they can't get back to sleep. Sometimes they just can't let go of a problem. They just keep going and going and going, and it, it affects their entire life, affects their relationships, affects their health. And it is a factor in healthcare. And it's definitely a factor for healthcare professionals. Um, like I mentioned, healthcare professionals are, are a highly stressed group of people, very stressed. Picture, you know, Joe Smith comes in to see his physician, and Joe Smith says, Doc, 
you know, Doc, I'm having problems. I, you know, I can't sleep, I can't eat, uh, I'm irritable, I'm grouchy all the time, I have headaches, my stomach bothers me, I've lost my sex drive. Doc, what can you do for me? He's talking to a physician who's probably stressed out himself or herself and says, here, you know, have, here's a pill because they only have 15 minutes to see this particular patient and they got to move on and they're like, you know, 25 or 30 other patients in line. And that's kind of the reality of healthcare today. It's a very high pressure, high stress, very intense environment with life or death decisions and just a tremendous stress. And so worry is something that affects all of us, but toxic worry is maybe particularly more uh, apparent in healthcare professionals than, than for a lot of other uh, prof a lot of other occupations. So, what is it? Toxic worry. We're talking about that kind of worry that just eats away at your life, that really destroys quality of life. And, and, uh, and you just kind of can't let go of it. Kind of like my, my little character here in the middle. Um, what if? I work a lot with anxiety disorders and my anxiety disorder folks are always getting into anticipatory anxiety. What if? What if? What if this happened? What if that happened? How many things do you think you can come up with to what if about? You know, it's endless, okay? And a lot of people just can't stop doing that. So, where does it start? Well, it starts in all kinds of ways. I mean, some people have gone through some really difficult times. Some people had a difficult uh, childhood. Some people had parents who were worriers, and they just kind of naturally learned how to worry. Um, sometimes an entire population has toxic worry. H how many people have depression error parents? in here, okay, all right? A lot of people went through the depression. It's like they've been changed for the, the whole rest of their life. They're different. You know, they, 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 they save, they're really worried that it's gonna happen again. So they've been altered. And a lot of people who go through difficult times, they're changed and they become more prone to toxic worry. Now, here's a quote I really love from Rollo May, who was a uh, psychoanalytic person years and years ago. Rollo May said, real freedom, real freedom, not, not the freedom we think we have, because most of us are kind of like reacting our way through life. You know, we're just kind of programmed to respond in a particular way. And we think we're making choices, but we're making choices based upon what's happened before. But real freedom, is not being mindless and reactive about things, as most people are most of the time, but it's being really mindful and re really able to just slow it down, kind of have a sense of what's going on within you, in your emotions and in your head. It's the ability to pause between stimulus and response, and in that pause to be able to make a choice, an emotionally intelligent choice. A choice where you're managing your emotions rather than your emotions managing you. And with the anxiety folks I work with, that's really what we're working on, is to develop this quality, this, this ability to be mindful, to be self-aware, and to be able to manage yourself in a much more stress-free, worry-free kind of way. And we're going to talk about how to do that. Uh, the, the full, a full quote from Rollo May is, same thing, it's just a little more complicated. He says, human freedom involves our capacity to pause. Might be a split second to pause between stimulus and response and in that pause, that tiny piece of time, to choose one response toward which we wish to throw our weight, really commit ourselves. The capacity to create ourselves based upon this freedom is inseparable from consciousness or self-awareness. So we're talking about how to be mindful and how to be emotionally uh, intelligent. Uh, a big part of this is being able to be mindful of your self-talk. You know, you all know what I mean by self-talk? Okay, we all talk to ourselves all the time. Okay, we, we do. Um, there was a time when if you pulled up next to somebody in their car next to you at the stoplight and they were talking, you thought that was odd. Now they're just, you know, talking to their cell phone. But... Yeah, we all talk to ourselves. It's okay if you talk out loud to yourself. As long as you know who's doing the talking. That's the important part, <laughs> right? Uh, but we all talk to ourselves. Now, sometimes our internal self-talk is very dysfunctional. You know, being human, we all deny and distort and falsify reality all the time. We're human. We do that. 
But sometimes it's particularly toxic in that we tell ourselves very, very negative things about ourselves, and we absolutely believe it. We, we are often unable to see these thoughts as only a story that my mind is telling me. It's not reality, it's just a story that my mind tells me. When you accept it as absolute reality, you're in trouble. Like, for example, suppose I, I every time things aren't going well, suppose I tell myself, I'm, I'm a stupid jerk. And suppose I'm fused with that stupid jerk thought. This is my stupid jerk thought. And it's part of me now, right? It's stuck to me. Now, that's going to affect everything I do, every relationship I have, every interaction I have, because I'm stuck to the stupid jerk thought. But what if I could mindfully, you know, calm myself down, slow things down, actually see my thoughts as only thoughts, they're just thoughts. They're not, they don't have to be real. And what if I could defuse this thought and say, ah, you know, when my boss yells at me, there's that stupid jerk thought. I kind of know where that comes from. Well, I don't really have to go with that. Okay? I can, I can choose an opposite action. I can choose to do something different. Wow. Can you imagine as you develop this kind of discipline to be mindful of what's going on within you and to defuse these thoughts and see them as only stories you're telling yourself? Can you imagine the power that gives you over toxic worry? And that's what we're talking about. Um, you need to be able to recognize your own distorted thinking. I mentioned that as human beings we all deny and distort and falsify reality all the time. But often we're not aware that we're distorting. Distortions, uh, like black or white thinking, all or none thinking. Uh, obvious examples, let me see. Um, you all know somebody who thinks she's either you know, perfectly thin or terribly fat. There's nothing in between, right? And uh, I work a lot with eating disorders. Uh, I've worked with people that have told me, and they were quite serious, they told me that if they gained one pound they were going to kill themselves because they'd be a failure in life. Right? That's pretty serious. But they're believing their own stuff. So all, all, all or none thinking, black or white thinking, dichotomous thinking, either or. Um, making assumptions, believing those assumptions are absolute reality without checking them out. Excessive self-criticism. I try to get people to be mindful of the way they talk to themselves about themselves inside their own head. So I'll ask you all to do the same thing right now. Like, when you're talking to yourself about yourself, is that self-talk you know, harsh and naggy and critical? Or is it soft and gentle and encouraging and accepting? Which is it? If it's harsh, guess what? You know, I tell people in therapy, I tell them like in the first 15 minutes, I, I give them this little demonstration. I say, look, you know, that's what we're all about here. You know, that's the bottom line is we got to turn down the volume over here. Maybe we can't make it go away altogether, but we need to turn down the volume and we need to really increase this. Now, as we increase self-acceptance and compassion with self, Guess what? People start getting rid of addictions. They stop overeating. They stop drinking too much. They start taking better care of themselves. Life starts to change in a very, very, very nice way. Um, negative expectations. Um, some people can't let go of the fact that uh, they, they aren't perfectly successful. A perfectionist is not someone who is perfect, just someone who thinks that he or she should be perfect and they torture themselves. They might, I work with very successful people. I've worked with, uh, I've worked with surgeons who have felt that they were a failure in life at any moment. People would find out that they were a total phony. Okay? Um, Overgeneralization. You know, if something happens, then I'm a failure. If I flunked my geometry exam, I'm going to be a street person. Right? People think like that, right? They do. Okay. Magnification, awfulizing or catastrophizing. Um, a lot of people come to see me for stress and depression and anxiety, uh, really get into awfulizing and catastrophizing, predicting failure, predicting a lack of success, predicting that things aren't going to go well for them. Labeling or mislabeling. Uh, labeling like yourself, you know, say, I'm stupid. Um, I'm working with a 
a teenager right now who is extremely bright and somehow she's become convinced that she's extremely stupid and so I'm gonna, I've got to prove to her that she's really bright. I mean she's one of the most articulate people I know. You know, it's obvious that she's bright but she thinks she's stupid and she, she readily says, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. Well you know what? If you keep telling yourself you're stupid, um, not only are you going to be very unhappy, but you're not going to try a lot of things that might be very satisfying for you. You're going to hold back. Okay. Henry Ford said, uh, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, personalization. If uh, people on the other end of the office are talking, it must be about you, right? <laughs> you know, so, some people... Yeah, some people, uh, you know, see somebody come and they cross the street or go the other way because they, they know that person is thinking negative thoughts about them. Uh, emotional reasoning. Uh, if I feel stupid, I must be stupid. No, it's just an emotion and a story you're telling yourself. Emotions are just emotions. Jumping to conclusions. More of the same. Well, we... In, in therapy, we're, and in here, we're talking about eliminating negative self-talk. You've got to be aware of it first. You've got to be mindful that it's there. And that you do have this internal critic. Who's your internal critic? That's the part of you that's saying, you know, you can't do it, you're stupid, uh, you should have done this, uh, you're not good enough. Okay? You need to fire your internal critic and develop an attitude of, of self-compassion, self-acceptance. And we'll talk about strategies for doing that. Um, but what, one strategy is um, there's, there's something called rational emotive therapy, which I've practiced for about 40 years now. If something happens to you that's upsetting, first chance you get, go get a piece of paper and write down A, B, C. Okay? Start with C. And C is the emotional consequences. You start write down the feelings. Write down all the feelings you're aware of. Then you backtrack to A. A is the activating event or the situation. And, what's the si and that's like one line, you know, the situation. So the feelings might be, let, let me make up an example here. Uh, geometry. So, uh, one of my teenage clients flunked her geometry exam. Okay. Her feelings. We start at C, the emotional consequences. C. She was feeling um, embarrassment, shame, guilt, fear, dread, anxiety, um, despair, hopelessness. Wow, okay. What's the situation? Back to A, the activating event. Flunked to geometry exam. So the question is, let's call her Susie. All right, that's not her real name, but Susie. Um, is that automatic? I mean, does that necessarily follow that, uh, you know, uh, you, you're going to have all these heavy feelings if you flunk your geometry exam? She says, yes, every single time. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, Susie. If, if, we, if we had ten people, same situation, flunked their geometry exam, she said, well, that, that happened. Half my class flunked. I said, okay, so we have ten people flunk their geometry exam. How many of them are going to be feeling hopeless and extremely guilty and full of despair. How many of them? She said, well, I guess I'm the, I'm the only one who does that. Said, okay, gee, we must be doing something different. So now we get to B. B is the beliefs, the self-talk. All the things she's telling herself about flunking geometry. As a first century philosopher said, Epictetus, he said, it's not the event that upsets us, it's what we tell ourselves about the event. Okay? What is Susie telling herself? She's telling herself, you know, I, I, uh, I, I cannot flunk a geometry exam. I'm really stupid if I flunk geometry. Uh, I'm a lousy student. My parents will be terribly ashamed of me. I will never complete high school. My future is ruined. I will never succeed. Uh, I can't stand this. I'm, I'm a terrible, stupid person. On and on and on. Now, everything I just mentioned, that's all distorted, negative, irrational self-talk. But we all do things like that. 
but we don't know that when we're doing it. So that I, I work on helping people be aware. And you know, writing it down with ABC, that's one way of becoming aware. Because if you do this again and again, you start finding that you've got the same dozen negative thoughts. And you start getting very, very good at catching yourself in the act. And you say, oh, wait a minute. No, I, no I'm not going to do that again. I know that's not true. So you can change your thinking. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, um, part of that is eliminating shoulds and must. I should be doing this. I must be doing that. Um, uh, Albert Ellis, whom I studied with, who developed uh, rational motor therapy, he talked about um, compulsive masturbation. Uh, he also said people need to stop shooting all over themselves. Um, anyway, uh, and again, rational motor therapy and other cognitive therapies are ways of doing this. Just practicing mindfulness, mindfulness meditation is a way of doing this, of becoming more aware. They're like two things you need to be working on self awareness and self-management in an emotionally intelligent way. Okay, so let's talk about how to incorporate all this in, into your daily stress management program. Remember last week we talked about your daily stress management program? And we're going to have a whole session really breaking that down and going into more detail about how you can kind of pace yourself through the day and manage your stress uh, step by step all the way through the day. Here, here are some strategies that you might incorporate right now into your daily stress management program. Number one is don't worry alone. You know, I don't know of anybody who is so well put together that they can't get themselves in real trouble if the only voice they're listening to is their own. They kind of like think themselves into a bad place. But we all need some warm, confidential relationships. We all need to have people that we trust that we can turn to and talk to about what's troubling us. And often, what happens when you, when you talk about something that's really worrying you? What happens usually if you're talking to somebody who's a good listener? Not somebody who loads you up with advice, but somebody who just really tries to understand. What happens when you can do that? It often feels better. I have people come in and they're totally stressed out and they just want to talk and they talk and talk and talk and I'm having trouble saying anything. And they might get up and leave at the end of the session and say, oh, wow, that really helped. I really feel better. And I haven't done anything, right? We, we, uh, Rob and I have our, our Dalmatians with us. And, um, and that even helps, too. Because just, just, uh, often uh, I have a client who will sit on the sofa with one of the Dalmatians, petting the Dalmatian. I have one lady leave, and she said, oh, I feel so much better. Thank you. That, 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 was, that was great. That was wonderful. And I said, well, I'm glad, you, uh, I'm glad you got something out of it. She said, well, not you. It was the dog. So, anyway. <laughs> so don't worry alone. Don't worry alone. Connect with people. Um, do your homework. Collect the facts. You know, if you, if you um, get out of the shower and, and you notice uh, you got this, uh, this mole on your arm and you never noticed it before, uh, hmm, wow, looks suspicious. Maybe, oh, wow. And you worry and worry and worry. Wow. Get the facts. You know, check it out. Um, and next, develop a plan. Develop a plan. Uh, a lot of people worry non-productively. They worry about the same thing they worried about last year and the year before, and they and they worry about it next year. But they would be a whole lot better off if they would sit down and think, okay, it is what it is. Now, what's my plan? How am I going to deal with it? I like that phrase, by the way, it is what it is. It's reality, or as Robin Williams said, reality, what a concept. You know, just, it is what it is. So we need to be just accepting what is and figuring out what we can do with that. Remember we talked about the serenity prayer last time, right? You know, God grant me the uh, courage to change the things I can change and the the serenity to uh, accept the things I can't change and the wisdom to know which is which. Often we get confused on that. Practice brain maintenance. What is brain maintenance? Well, if you're sleep deprived, you're not doing your brain much good. Uh, you're going to be far more prone to worry and stress if you're not getting enough sleep. And Americans are chronically 
sleep deprived. We're the most sleep deprived people on the planet. We're probably in the history of the planet. Okay? Uh, getting proper sleep is really, really important. Also good nutrition. That means not trying to deal with your stresses f with food. You know, Ernie works with a lot of folks who do that. You know. Um, uh, eating, eating a balanced diet, uh, eating uh, regular meals, uh, having good nutrition. You really will feel better, and if you feel better, you'll perform better, and you'll have less stress in your life. Everything will go better. It really does work. Same with exercise. Uh, exercise, uh, I, 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 I don't understand why a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists don't push everybody to exercise because it's kind of a natural stress reliever and kind of a natural antidepressant. It works. Okay? If you're exercising regularly, you have a sense of ownership of your life and you're uh, not, not only are you more... Um, to have better posture and uh, breathe better and uh, have more agility and energy and stamina and endurance and you, know, and you lose weight, flexibility, but also you're more creative and you're more resilient and you deal with depression and anxiety a whole lot better than if you weren't exercising. You know, check it out. And prayer and or meditation. I'm, I, I teach uh, mindfulness meditation and uh, I have, sometimes I have people say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, okay, there's nothing incompatible. Christians meditate too, okay? They often call it contemplative prayer, but same thing, okay? Meditation. There's so much evidence that if you meditate regularly, uh, you are going to manage your life a whole lot better. You're going to be more compassionate toward yourself and other people. Uh, you could be more moral, more just, more balanced. Okay, manage your stress. And finally, the fifth fifth worry management strategy is let it go. And that's my mantra. And that kind of goes along with uh, um, the serenity prayer. Let it go. You know, think about all the things that you worry about. How how many of them actually happen? If you can say it to yourself in a very quiet, gentle, inner voice, whew, let it go. It's all right. Slow it down. And there are more tips. Like more effective self-talk, you know, more realistic self-talk. We, we kind of talked about that, how to cultivate that. Uh, telling yourself things that really have some evidence to back them up. Okay, um, having a great support system. We all need that. If you don't have one, you need to be building one. If you have toxic people in your life, maybe you need to, you know, quarantine yourself and find some other people. Um, Self-compassion. Remember the difference between the naggy, harsh inner voice and the compassionate inner voice. We we want the compassionate. Okay. Laugh. Find humor in things. If you're laughing, uh, you're, you're really helping your immune system. If you can't laugh, you're in trouble. Don't self-medicate. And, and we self-medicate with alcohol, with food, with gambling, with um, sex, with shopping, with uh, pills. Um, I think self-medication is like anything that you do to distract yourself from dealing, having to deal with you. Okay. And some, some way of just numbing out and distracting yourself so that you can avoid dealing with the real stuff. Sunshine. You know, just getting, um, wear your sunblocker, by the way, but, yeah, you know, get out and let the sun hit your retina. That, that has, that's a natural antidepressant. Uh, have the kind of lighting that um, uh, really uh, helps you feel more up. If you go into a, a brightly lit room with the right kind of lighting that really helps your mood uh, quick burst of high energy exercise if you're feeling kind of down and stressed and depressed get up walk around I work with creative people and uh, people who have writer's block I say hey you know what I got a great cure for writer's block just leave the computer get up walk around the block I guarantee you you'll have some fresh ideas while you're doing it works every time try it just Get active. You know, break the state. Do something different. And that's what I call changing the channel. 
You know, if you're stuck on a depression anxiety channel, change the channel. Do something different. Take a trip. Take a vacation. Um, go do something you've never done before. Change the channel. Music. All these photos are from my, like my backyard. I live up in the mountains. Uh, music. Music, uh, particularly right kind of music. I mean, some music is kind of anxiety producing, but right kind of music like uh, Mozart or, or whatever, you know, can be, it's kind of naturally soothing and kind of works against worry. Human touch, massage, uh, can really help you relax and not worry. Um, ration your online time. A lot of stuff online and, and spending endless hours online can actually be very worrisome, you know, very stressful. Try to, try to ration that. Go for human moments. What do I mean by human moments? I mean, try to connect with people, you know, and, and uh, if, um, if you're looking at your spouse and you, uh, during the course of the day, you have some positive thoughts about your spouse, but you never express them, well, express them. Let your spouse know. Talk to people and uh, connect with people. Um, ration the news. If you want to get a good night's sleep, you probably don't want to watch the 11 o'clock news and then watch a rerun on the, the news. Utilize experts. You know, if you're worried about something like uh, your taxes or your health or anything else, get an expert. Find some help. Don't try and take on everything yourself. I don't know of anybody who's an expert in everything they need to take care of. Um, be, be mindful of moral self-diagnosis. You know, concluding you're a bad person or a sinful, evil person or, you know, no. Um, a lot of us are kind of stuck in that because of the way we grew up. You need to move away from that. That doesn't mean be immoral. It just means, uh, you know, cut yourself some slack because you are, after all, a fallible human being who makes mistakes. And that's, that's everybody. That's all of us. Uh, smile, laugh, whistle, sing. Try and worry and whistle at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't know that you can do it, try, but try it. Try it. Next time you catch yourself worrying, whistle. Uh, journal. Write things down. That's very helpful. It helps you put things in perspective. Um, uh, sunshine. I think we could have talked about sunshine. Uh, right choices. Uh, if, um, if you're really down on yourself for the things you're doing, well, consider whether maybe you need to change what you're doing. Maybe you need to be acting in a way that's more congruent with your values. And then maybe you would feel a whole lot better and worry a whole lot less. Banish toxic worry. Think of all you worried about last year and then ask yourself, how many of those things actually came true? Probably none of them. Okay? And if none of these things work, get professional help. Um, often a, a, a professional who is used to working with anxiety and stress can really help you navigate through this. And it can wind up being a very cost-effective kind of thing to do. Um, my final tip here, I'm borrowing a, a line from Henry David Thoreau. He said, dwell as near as possible to the channel in which your life flows. What do you think he meant by that? Anybody have any ideas? Uh, well, yeah, it could be. I, I think it's kind of like know yourself and know what's really, really, really important to you. You know, what is it you most deeply value? And, and, and live your life accordingly, you know. Uh, be, be congruent. Um, pursue the things that give you, get, give you a real sense of satisfaction and accomplishment. Um, try to get away from doing things that just because uh, somebody told you you should. You know, try to be who you were meant to be. You know, and, and, and cut yourself some slack. Again, be compassionate. Let yourself, you know, uh, let yourself be more self-accepting. Let yourself enjoy life more. Okay. Questions? Good time to ask questions. Any questions you got? Yes.
What if you can't sleep? Okay. Um, well, there, you know, there, there are a number of strategies for, for getting sleep. The worst thing you can do if you have trouble sleeping is to worry about sleeping. You know? You, you ever catch yourself, try to catch yourself falling asleep? It's like you're laying there and you say, okay, now, next, this next moment I'm going to fall asleep. No, it didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> you could do that all night long. Uh, I went to a, a, a workshop years ago where I was going to be a, a speaker, and uh, I, I was really energized, and I was so energized I had trouble sleeping. And then I got to worrying about sleeping, and I stayed up the entire night. And I looked in the mirror first thing in the morning, and I looked like I'd been on an all-night drunk. For, fortunately, I had some murine with me, or Visine, or one of those, and, and I cleared up my eyes, and I went and I did the workshop. It all went well. I was tired, but it all went well, and I really slept well. That that night. And I, I learned from that. I learned that, okay, I, I can do without sleep. You know, I, 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 I don't have to sleep. I'll be tired. Worst thing that can happen is I'll be tired. And I think that's the last time I worried about getting to sleep. It's like, okay, if I sleep, I sleep. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. And instead I shift my thinking to uh, listening to bird sounds outside or thinking about pleasant things. It's a good time to do some uh, some breathing exercises like diaphragmatic breathing. We talked about that last time. We're, to, we're going to talk about that some more. Um, if you're in the meditation, that's a good time to do it. Uh, any relaxation training skills like progressive muscle relaxation. We're going to talk about a lot of these things. In other words, try to don't watch the 11 o'clock news. Don't watch a action movie. You know, just try to settle down and think about peaceful things and don't worry about sleeping. Okay? And th there's some other strategies as well, but that's kind of like the short answer. The worst thing you can do is worry about sleep. Just tell yourself, hey, if I, if I don't sleep, I'll be tired. I'm not going to worry about it. And for a lot of people, that helps. So, yeah, other questions? No other questions? Okay. Two weeks from now, we're going to deal with uh, another aspect of stress management. Uh, I'm going to make it different every two weeks, and uh, I'm going to start incorporating some handouts and some self-assessments. And uh, my, my goal is to start posting some things on, on YouTube on, along the lines of... Uh, uh, mindfulness meditation and relaxation skills. I want to post some different types of strategies so that you can kind of learn about them in here and then go tune into YouTube and actually practice them. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>